the same animals that strike terror in the hearts of swimmers generate excitement with many scuba divers. In an ironic twist, divers deliberately seek face-to-face -face encounters with some of the ocean's most dangerous predators, sharks. Dr. Eric Ritter is a leading authority on shark behavior and a passionate supporter of human and shark interaction. In the spring of 2002, he paid a very high price for his beliefs. A severe attack nearly cost him his leg and his life. Sharks fuel a booming ecotourism industry. From tropical seas to the cold waters of the Pacific Northwest, sharks are big business. A shark feeding frenzy. A fascinating and frightening spectacle. Dozens of predators slash and tear at their prey with razor sharp teeth. But this exciting display is not a random act in nature's grand design. It's a carefully choreographed event staged for the benefit of scuba divers. It's a fair assumption that most people would avoid intentional contact with sharks, but many scuba divers and snorkelers line up to interact with the animals. Believe it or not, shark encounters are becoming one of the most popular attractions in the sport. sharks, one towers above the rest in our collective imaginations. The Great White. Even though human fatalities have decreased, the visceral horror of being eaten alive remains. Since the dawn of time, people have been terrified of sharks. But in a deeply primitive sense, we admire them we're transfixed by predators that can kill us. This fascination is the inspiration for the holy grail of shark dives. The Cape of Good Hope, one of the most treacherous bodies of water on Earth. Winter storms work their way north from Antarctica and pound the battered coastline. Windswept shores provide refuge for tens of thousands of South African fur seals. On land, they are clumsy and slow. Underwater, the nimble seals are eager to show off their acrobatic skills. These seas are not safe for even the most agile pinniped. This is the hunting ground of the Great White.
South African fishing village of Hunsby, great whites fuel a burgeoning dive tourism industry. J.P. Bota and Andre Hartman operate Marine Dynamics, one of the most successful shark diving companies in the country. Both were formerly commercial fishermen, but with dwindling catches, they turned to ecotourism, specifically shark tourism. Their business plan is simple. Wait for good weather, ferry visitors out to sea, and get them up close and personal with great whites. The South African white shark diving business around Hanspai started in the early 90s. In the beginning, there were only three operators. It grew to the eight operators we have at the moment. Initially, there was a sort of an emotional outcry and people were really concerned that the number of, of shark attacks would increase due to the commercial activity of attracting sharks. That fortunately has proved to be a false fear. This activity does not necessarily lead to more shark attack. And of course, the statistics have also been with us so that the number of shark attacks have actually not increased. The local economy has benefited quite substantially by the shark tourism. The industry employs about 40 to 50 people and these people spend their money in the local businesses. So there's a lot of spin-offs emanating from the shark business. To attract the sharks, Andre Hartman first chums the water with a pungent combination of blood and fish remains. The scent of cow shark liver is a particular favorite of great whites. Coaxing them to the stern, Andre demonstrates an unusual phenomenon. Pushing aside the snout of a shark one day, he discovered that the animal became almost catatonic. It rolled its eyelids down, rose out of the water, opened its mouth and snapped its jaws. The strange behavior appears to be related to highly specialized sensory organs in their nose and mouth, touching them momentarily short circuits their senses. Most customers view sharks from the safe confines of a boat or from a protective cage, but a few brave souls pay extra for the privilege of venturing into the water without the security of steel bars. At the surface, Andre Hartman acts as a safety diver and occasionally shows off. Do not try this at home. On the sea floor, a cautious Hartman scents the water with fish blood. The diver's expectations are exceeded. A 15-foot white shark appears like a ghostly apparition. We were underwater for about 40 minutes, and of course the action all happens near the end of the dive. We were starting to get cold. Water temperature there was about 52, 53 degrees. And you're looking through the small viewfinder and trying to keep it framed and focused, and the shark comes out of the gloom and simply just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and fills the frame on this high-definition camera. It's pretty awe-inspiring. That shark swam right around us a couple times, looked at us, examined us, then made a pass across the bottom and right at the camera. Sharks don't have fingers and hands to test things with, so what they have to do is bite something. 
Unfortunately, because of their enormous size and tremendous strength, when they bite something, even though they're just sampling it, and you really couldn't consider that a shark attack, it doesn't make much difference to the person that's been sampled. It still hurts. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. The shark showed recent signs of mating activity. Deep scars along her side indicated a bite from a very large male. only speculate on the size of the animal that inflicted these wounds. It seems like the more time I spend in the water with sharks, the more I realize that when you look into their eyes as they swim by you, and eye contact is very important with wildlife, there's someone in there. It's not just a stupid animal swimming by. Sharks are not maniacal or dangerous man-eating machines that are swimming around looking for humans to eat. They're really not. In the Bahamas, over a hundred sharks show up for a feeding. But how do you get out of the way of a frenzied mob? At the northernmost tip of the Bahamas, 100 miles east of the Florida coast, lies Walker's Key. The island is a renowned sport fishing destination and hosts thousands of visitors each year. Seizing on the availability of leftover fish parts, shark diving pioneer Gary Atkinson found a novel means of recycling normally discarded carcasses. We're a premier fishing destination. Subsequently, as the fish would come into our fish cleaning room, uh, we save those carcasses. We recycle those fish heads and, and carcasses back into the environment. One day my staff came up to me and said, uh, Gary, when we go down to dump the carcasses at the end of the runway, the sharks hear the trucks coming and they gather. Well, I took a look at this and was astounded by it. And I thought, well, it would be a natural progression then to relocate it out to the reef. And subsequently, that's what we did. We started saving the carcasses, packing them, created the chum sickle. Basically, with the chum sickle is carcass feeding, which is very natural for this predator. So we wanted to present it to him in as natural a form as possible that he would understand. And in no way then would it also connect it to us as the diver, that we were, we were going to be uh, just viewed as another predator down there on the dive. He showed up for the same reason they did. And that's why we can do the dive as safely as we do it and why we've never had a single incident of agonistic display in 11 years. Probably 35,000 people have done this experience, including children as young as four years old, uh, having animals within just uh, a few feet of them. At the dive site, the captain revs the boat's engines. The noise is a cue for the sharks that a feeding is about to begin. Hold it right there. As the frozen block of bait sinks, only a few sharks appear to be interested. Other fish are quick to take advantage of the free meal. Once thought to be set off by a single drop of blood, the infamous feeding frenzy may instead be incited by several different stimuli. The vibrations and head shaking of the first fish to feed, the scent trail, and the visual commotion all combine to excite the sharks.
As the bait ball wears down, it eventually falls to the bottom. But the sharks then fight for the remaining morsels of food. Publicized attacks in 2001 spawned the Summer of the Shark. Overnight, shark bites and sightings became front page news. Lost in the hype was the fact that there were far fewer attacks that year than the previous year. Why only four deaths were attributed to sharks in 2001. The summer of the shark dramatically changed public perception, taking it several steps backward to the old Jaws mentality of the 70s. The past quarter century since that landmark film has not been kind to sharks. Virtually all species have seen population declines of between 50 and 90 percent. The strain on their numbers comes primarily from overfishing. Federal regulations restrict shark fishing in U.S. waters, but the animals are targeted relentlessly in much of the world. Their cartilage is still considered a cancer treatment, and Asian demand for shark fin soup supports a wasteful finning industry. One of the main goals of diving operators such as Gary Atkinson at Walker's Key is to increase awareness of the shark's plight through interaction with the animals in their natural habitat. I think it's so vitally important that people learn as much as they can about an animal that is really misunderstood. In doing this experience and in, in trying to educate people and hopefully stop the slaughter of these sharks, I feel that what we do is significant. The reason we do what we do is it's a myth exploder. People suddenly realize that, she was, I'm down here with 100 animals and I'm safe and they could care less that I'm here and they walk away with a whole different rich experience than they ever thought they'd get when they first arrived here. That's the seed you're planting out there because they're gonna tell other people. Sharks have a bad rap as it is anyway and I feel like our job here is to let people know that they're not the bad guy people have made them out to be. If sharks are not the bad guys, why would they attack and nearly kill one of their staunchest supporters? Dr. Eric Ritter is a leading authority on shark behavior and a forensic investigator of shark attacks. Ritter has been instrumental in helping to change the popular perception of sharks as terrors of the sea to a vital species which deserves protection. Over the past two decades, Eric has introduced hundreds of students, photographers, and biologists to sharks. With a keen passion for the animals and their plight, he is one of few researchers who dares to freely swim with dangerous sharks. Ritter works exclusively outside the protection of a cage. What I'm studying is the body language of sharks. I'm interested in how sharks express their intentions when they approach humans. Shark-human interaction is a very new field, but it's most likely the very field we need to understand these animals. We cannot just observe them by sitting on boats, sitting in front of aquariums. We have to interact with them. My main theory is that sharks are as predictable as dogs, parrots, cats. Animals that we are comfortable with, animals that we're used to. We're not used to be with sharks. We have to just give them the chance to let them interact with us. In a unique experiment at Walker's Key, 
Gary Atkinson and Dr. Ritter attract a handful of large sharks to shallow water. One of Eric's more controversial theories is that dangerous animals like bull and lemon sharks are not inclined to attack humans, even when enticed with bait. He believes attacks are caused by curiosity or mistaken identity and should be referred to more appropriately as shark accidents. More than 80% of attack victims survive, mainly because sharks realize their mistake and don't return for a second bite. Ritter simulates common attack scenarios, such as those on swimmers in shallow water and those on spear fishermen in deeper seas. Throughout his experiments, fish carcasses are thrown into the surf very near to where he stands or swims. The most often seen action scenario we have is through exploratory behavior, meaning the animal sees us, not us as a human being, but us as an object. Several factors come together, for example, sound, smell, motion of the object. Sharks, per se, are very curious animals. They have a very high level of hesitance, but if their curiosity takes over at the end, they may grab an object just to get a final idea of what the object could be, because nothing they sense is conclusive. So that's why, in very rare cases, they still grab the object. In the spring of 2002, after nearly two decades and over a thousand dives with dangerous sharks, Eric's luck finally ran out. He was severely bitten on the leg by a bull shark. A journalist accompanying Eric nervously paced and stirred up debris, reducing visibility. Quickly, the situation turned deadly. A large female bull shark was cornered between the two and lashed out at Eric. What led to this bite that I had with the bull shark was one of a general situation we've done hundreds and hundreds of times. The person next to me did not stand still as I told him to. He walked back and forth and so by walking back and forth, he stirred up a lot of sand. And so we lowered the visibility. So it was us who created the situation, not the animals. The second I got bitten, I lifted my leg right away because I had to get out of her mouth. And the problem is if you have a 400 pound animal attached to you, there's nearly nothing you can do. I mean, you always hear, well, hit an animal, do this, and that doesn't work. She let go, I looked at my leg, and I realized, um, first of all, it's not much left, and second of all, I knew I am gonna die within the next two or three hours because I've seen many of these wounds, and I knew how they're gonna end if they do not get proper treatment. Eric was fortunate. A small plane and its pilot were on the island at the time of the accident. Within 30 minutes of the bite, he was on his way to West Palm Beach, where a team of doctors was waiting. He nearly died due to an enormous loss of blood. Once stabilized, it appeared that he would lose his leg, but skilled surgeons miraculously managed to save it. Months of rehabilitation and a determined will spurred an amazing recovery. Additional reconstructive surgeries and skin grafts helped to restore use of his leg. The first time I jumped back in the water was about four months after my bite. The wound healed so far that I could be in the water 15, 20 minutes. So the first opportunity I had, I jumped right back in at the very spot where I got bitten. I want that everybody sees these animals the way I see them. I want them to see the animals through my eyes.
I see it even more clear what we have to do. We have to destroy the myth, the bad rap of these animals, and portray them the way they really are. They're fascinating, incredibly intelligent, curious. So I'm back in the water. I interact with sharks more than ever. So I'd say I do this for the rest of my life. What is the fastest growing and most popular attraction for scuba diving tourists? Another Bahamian island is the epicenter of the shark diving industry. At New Providence, half a dozen scuba operations rely on sharks as a main attraction for diving tourists. As for the sharks, what we don't want you guys doing is swimming with your hands, okay? These sharks are attracted to movement more than the blood in the water. Unlike the bait ball style of feeding at Walker's Key, sharks here are fed by hand or with a steel pole. Shark wranglers utilize a chainmail suit, which helps prevent injury, but a crushing bite can still hurt. The difficult part initially is to keep the ravenous animals away from the bait. Like pigs at the trough, they jostle for position. After using a pole, the wrangler moves towards the divers and feeds by hand. For the customers, this close-up action is a thrilling introduction to sharks. Yeah, it was pretty comfortable down there until uh, the sharks got real close to you. I mean, I got pretty nervous. I've always thought they were pretty aggressive, but being down there today while they were feeding them and everything, they looked like gentle giants down there. This dive is really, really good. Never been so close to sharks. Other divers have seen them in the, in the blue in the distance, but never, never so close up. It's almost like he's roughhousing dogs. Whenever a couple of sharks would come up to him and he would just push their snoot away or whatnot, he'd grab a hold of them and roughhouse them or pet them, so it was pretty neat. The first thing this morning, we never would have known that we were going to be shark diving today, that's for sure. We just uh, happened to run across it and it sounded like a cool thing to do, so we said, ah, let's go shark diving. It was just a fantastic experience. From an economic standpoint, shark feeding I'm very much in favour of. Some people don't approve of shark feeding. They feel that we've changed the behaviour of sharks. Yes, to a certain degree we have. Taken this area, we've probably changed the behavior of about 100 uh, sharks, slightly. But they're still in their own environment. They generate a lot of income for the Bahamas, and those same sharks generate revenue year in, year out. Shark feeding is definitely becoming more popular, and it definitely does contribute towards the conservation of sharks. These people who would have otherwise viewed them as dangerous man-eaters and not cared about them, once they've been on a feed, they've seen them feeding, they're seeing they're not these vicious creatures, they're far more inclined to support conservation issues. Most shark encounters occur in the warm tropics, but what animals lurk in the cold, deep sea? Shark diving is not confined to the tropics or to shallow temperate waters. In the dark, frigid realm of the deep sea lives a mysterious giant, the six-gill shark. 
ancient hunters, unchanged since dinosaurs roamed the earth, they inhabit great depths. These living fossils can attain a length of over 20 feet. There are only a handful of places where six-gill sharks are frequently encountered in shallow water. Washington State's Puget Sound and the Pacific coast of Canada. One of the best places to photograph and study the sharks at scuba diving depths is British Columbia's Hornby Island. Zelinsky and Amanda Heath operate a busy scuba diving business on Hornby Island, and six gills are their number one attraction. Despite the cold seas and sometimes challenging diving conditions, the animals generate enormous interest. The main reason that people come to Hornby is to see the six gill sharks. They're a real draw here in the summer. We cater to about 500 diving tourists in the course of May to September and all of those people come with the intent of seeing the six gills if they're lucky enough to do so. Hornby Island is a unique location in that it's one of the few places in the world where we can observe six gills in water shallow enough to scuba dive in. In many cases, they're found at depths of uh, several thousand feet, which is unreachable by people under most circumstances. Sport diver tourists come here, as well as uh, scientists, film crews, uh, still photographers, etc., who are interested in an opportunity to see the six-gill in its natural habitat. Researcher Dr. Robert Dunbrack of Newfoundland's Memorial University searches for clues to the behavior and biology of these enigmatic sharks. Each summer aboard his research vessel, the Stalvik, Dumbrack travels to tiny Flora Islet off the coast of Hornby Island. Six gills and their unusual habits pose many intriguing questions, but simply finding the elusive animals is the first of many challenges. It was much more difficult than we originally thought it might be to work on the six gills. We thought we could just do a bit of diving and the six gills would be there and we could make behavioral observations in a way that we might do on, let's say, polar bears or some sort of terrestrial mammal. The study site that we settled on was on floor islets off Hornby Island. We spent a few days there on our research vessel looking for sharks and didn't see anything and we were prepared then to leave and go and find another site. But on the, our last dive we saw eight sharks in, in one dive so that as soon as we saw that we decided this was a place to do the work. The unanswered question about these sharks of course is why are they coming into shallow water? They're deep water sharks, they're known virtually throughout all the oceans of the world but only from deep waters. Well, a natural thing to conclude is that they're coming in to feed because this is what animals have to do most of the time is look for food, but we have no evidence that they are feeding. It's not known whether they feed at night and maybe come onto the reef during the day for some other reason. Dunbrack quickly realized that direct observation of the animals was very difficult depth and time constraints, cold water and currents, and finally locating the sharks on the deep reef made research a daunting task. To aid in his studies, he devised two ingenious yet simple methods of observing and recording six gills and their behavior. We have built a time-lapse video system that allows us to put a video camera down. It takes pictures 
four frames every 10 seconds or so. On a single film, we're able to get two to three to four weeks, depending on the time of year. It's just a daylight system. We also have set up a stereo system which consists of two video cameras that are cabled directly to the surface. They look over the same area, they're facing down off the reef wall, and so the sharks will, will swim underneath these two cameras. And based on the geometry of the cameras, we can actually get measurements, direct measurements of the size of the sharks as they pass underneath, and also their swimming speed, which we can use for metabolic studies. That's great. I'm going to the truth. Early in the summer field season, Dunbrack made a curious discovery. Harbor seals and stellar sea lions, prey for other large sharks, were interacting with the six gills. Video monitors and time-lapse cameras revealed the startling behavior. Now what was that being? Oh, that's interesting. That's a seal, right? A seal. Chasing him. I don't believe this. Wow, it's amazing. The seals directly underneath the sharks are coming underneath them and sort of buzzing them. Six gill sharks are not known to feed on seals or sea lions. It appears that the playful mammals are simply curious about their large visitors from the deep. In recent years, fossil remains of prehistoric relatives of six gill sharks have been discovered on Hornby Island. Over 25 species of mostly deep water sharks from the Cretaceous period have been identified from fossilized remains. Fossil shark teeth are very common but they're usually attributed to shallow water species. These puzzling clues appear to suggest that six gills and many other deep water sharks frequently ventured into shallow seas. Within a stone's throw of the site where we were watching these sharks swim around, there are fossils of the sharks that have been there over 65 million years ago. And looking at the teeth of those species, they're virtually indistinguishable from the teeth of the fish that we were looking at. Within the last 100 million years or so, they probably haven't changed much at all. With the collapse of many traditional commercial fish stocks, six gills were briefly considered a viable new fishery. But with little knowledge of their population, reproductive and growth rates, this ill-conceived plan was put on hold. Trying to run a fishery on a species like the six gill is very problematic. It's a large fish. It's certainly long-lived and has very low rates of reproduction. So the sustainable exploitation rates would be very low. So a large shark that might be 60 to 100 years old might fetch just a few dollars. Whereas we do know for a fact that this species probably brings in several million dollars a year just to the dive tourism industry as a living resource. The more people that interact with the sharks in a passive manner as divers and get a positive experience, the, the better it is really going to be for the shark. Despite many unanswered questions and an uncertain future, six gill sharks inspire tremendous respect from both scientists and scuba divers. Rob and I consider ourselves to be very lucky in that we're members of a very small select group that have seen a lot of six gill swimming in its natural habitat. It's something that many people can never dream of doing. It's an exciting thing to see this shark moving in its environment. It's really hard to describe the feelings that you have when you first encounter them. 
to put it in terrestrial terms, it would be similar to going through a hike in the West Coast and running into the elephants and the giant sloths that used to live there 12,000 years ago. It seems like a throwback to times when animals were bigger and more plentiful on these reefs. And it's a very stirring experience. There's virtually nothing that we know about this species, so anything that we get is going to be useful, and there's so much to know. It's something that could keep us going for many, many, many years. Many of us don't scuba dive or even snorkel. What better way to satiate our curiosity than to view sharks through six inches of glass? encounters are not the exclusive domain of scuba divers and marine biologists. The animals are also top attractions in zoos and aquariums. The public fascination with sharks is deeply rooted. People of all ages are mesmerized by the sleek and powerful fish. At the Atlantis Resort on Paradise Island in the Bahamas, sharks are a crowd favorite. You can even rock it down a water slide or river raft through the middle of their Mayan shark tank. I think the reason why people are so fascinated by sharks is because a lot of people don't know about sharks. They have a lot of misconceptions about sharks. They think sharks are these big, scary animals um, that as soon as you get into the water, they're going to attack you. Economically, Live sharks are much more valuable than dead sharks because they bring guests here. They want to see sharks and it also adds an educational value because it's much easier to teach somebody about sharks and how valuable they are if they can actually see something that's living. I think people appreciate that much more than they would seeing a, a specimen or just a photograph in a book. A rash of shark attacks in Florida and Hawaii led state authorities there to ban the practice of baiting sharks. But instead of decreasing attacks, the bans have proven to be ineffective. The same number of people were bitten in the past few years as there were before the bans were implemented. Although shark diving does attract and perhaps alter the behavior of a few animals, Feedings usually take place in deeper water, a long way from beaches and swimmers. Dr. Eric Ritter and others believe that shark baiting and chumming is a potential factor in attacks, but not because of scuba divers. I would say about 80 to 90 percent are caused by sport fishing. What they create is a very hazardous situation around themselves by chumming the water, by hooking fish. Sharks pick it up. You have people in the water frolicking until we find a way to reduce some of the sport fishing habits. We will always have the same number of shark bites on a yearly basis here in Florida. If the band really would have done what they predicted, meaning no accidents anymore, then at least it would be safer, but we still have the same accident rate each year. I definitely feel that organized shark feeding done properly is safe and it definitely raises awareness of this animal's plight and raises awareness of the animal's fragility and it's a myth destroyer. It's an animal that's been on this planet for close to half a billion years that has been brought to the verge of extinction in the past 20 years. And he's being wiped out at such a tremendous rate. You remove the shark, you suddenly turn our oceans in a very, very short period of time into a septic system. Our oceans are in trouble. If we don't protect this animal, then all of us lose. Everybody. And what a sad thing. I want my kids to see what I saw today.
Despite their strength and predatory skill, sharks are remarkably fragile creatures. Conservation efforts have traditionally had little support or enforcement. They aren't as cute and cuddly as dolphins or as majestic as whales. After all, on rare occasions, they do kill people. We are slowly coming to realize that sharks are integral members of the ocean food chain. We're learning that while a dead shark may bring a few dollars to a fisherman one time, a live shark may generate thousands of dollars in annual tourist revenue. And best of all, the shark is allowed to live. Perhaps scuba divers and other eco-tourists can ultimately play a key role in preserving these vital species. <laughs>